This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up, Charles Dauber, president and CEO of American Electric Technologies, a 65-year-old on-site power delivery company. Next up, we meet with Robin Kanok in Austin, Texas, where she visits with B.J. Stansberry, the founder, chairman, and chief science officer of Heliovolt, a solar manufacturing company. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Makers Show. Our guest now, Charles Dauber, President and CEO of American Electric Technologies. Charles, great to have you on the program. Glad to be here. So tell us about the company. American Electric Technologies, or as we call ourselves, AETI for short, right. uh, is just celebrated our 65th year in existence. We are a provider of what we call power delivery solutions for the global energy industry. Well, in 65 years, that, that's, a, that's a good run. We've managed to survive all the ups and downs in the energy industry, and I think we've learned some things along the way that we're trying to use now to help the energy industry meet some of its global demand requirements. And publicly traded? We were traded on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange as part of our growth strategy in 2007. We went public via reverse merger with an existing publicly traded company, and now we're off to the races. Well, help, help us understand exactly where you play. Mm -hmm. So our company makes what's called power delivery systems. And power delivery systems, think about it as gray metal boxes that enable energy projects to meet their objectives. So power delivery for a land drilling rig project, for example, would be taking the power from whatever generates the power, which is a diesel generator, right. and delivering it safely and effectively to the mechanical things that need to make that drilling rig work mud pumps, top drives, and draw works. For a downstream application, the source of the power may be the utility grid, and our power delivery equipment and services take that power and safely and effectively get it to the fractionator units that convert natural gas into usable uh, gas applications. Well, and how has this increased domestic production affected your business? It's, uh, it's a huge accelerator for a business. Um, we have a, a view of there's a sort of a offsetting sine waves for how the energy industry behaves over the last 65 years. First, there's typically an upswing in exploration and production, offset by a midstream uh, sine wave, and down, and then a, off, another offset for downstream. So, whereas a year ago, two years ago, we saw a big increase in our exploration and production, right. all those power systems deployed on drilling rigs found lots of natural gas. Now, the next part of our business is really taking off, which is the midstream, which is the pipelines where we do the uh, power systems for the compressor stations that shoot the natural gas uh, every hundred miles along the pipeline. And then we're seeing a huge increase in our downstream business, which is where these fractionation units are occurring. So, so is the goal for 2013 just keep up or are you targeting certain areas? Um, we're seeing uh, significant growth in a couple of areas in North America. First, the natural gas-based infrastructure build out right. um, in terms of midstream and downstream. We're seeing a lot of oil-based ENP work, uh, specifically in the Gulf of Mexico, picking up a lot driven by our neighbor to the south, uh, yeah. Pemex. So that's very good. Um, we are seeing a significant amount of growth internationally in emerging markets like China and Brazil. And the other half of our business that's not oil and gas is the power generation and distribution business, where we're seeing a significant move towards uh, what we'll call utility scale distributed generation, including solar power. So that's where we see the opportunities. Tell me about some of your international work, Brazil. Mm -hmm. We have been doing international business for 60 of our 65 years. Right. Um, we've built a core competency in taking this 
power delivery technologies and construction and services, same capabilities we have in the U.S. and taking them internationally. So we've been in Singapore for 17 years. I'll talk about China if you're interested later. Right. But what we've done in Brazil is Petrobras has identified $220 billion that they plan to spend on oil and gas infrastructure in the next four years. We normally see somewhere between 1% and 6% of those projects going towards things that we do. Right. So we are basically following our U.S. drilling contractors, the offshore drillers, who are going down and building and going after projects with Petrobras. So we've got a factory set up down there. We're doing construction and services down there. We set up that operation in 2010, and we're profitable in our first year of operation last year. Well, let's talk about China. China is a fascinating market to do business in, lots of challenges. We got lucky. Um, China National Petroleum Company, CNPC, which is one of the fourth largest, I think, energy company in the world, wanted to, as part of their corporate strategy, gain control over this core piece of technology for their land drilling operations, the power delivery systems. They did a global search, looked around the world for people who were comfortable in doing business in foreign markets and had who had that advanced technology, and they selected us. So we set up that joint venture in 2007 um, with their operating company, Bomco, which is a direct competitor to National OL Varco in Houston. So our joint venture is in Xi'an, China, which is where the Terracotta Warriors are from. And together, us and Bomco and our joint venture is called Bome, make about uh, somewhere between 80 and 100 drilling rigs a year where we provide all that power system, both for uh, China's domestic operations and whenever you see that China has done a country-to-country deal with uh, other countries, right. then the part of that those deals are typically um, exporting of Chinese drilling rigs and our power systems go along with that as well. An incredible success story and, and what is for many a difficult environment. The, the part that's interesting about China and most, I think, foreign companies tend to fail there is trying to hold the technology back and the Chinese know what you're doing, right? right? And so... I think there's really two tricks to doing business successfully in China. It's sharing the technology and helping make sure that once they've got the first version of your technology, that there's always something you can continue to work with them on the next thing and the next thing. And it's helped us basically make a huge amount of profits on this operation. A two odd million dollar investment has turned into $14 million of income and $8 million of cash back, which is very That's unusual. The other part that I think is important in China is is building the relationships, building that trust. And there's a lot of ways that go into that, but honestly, one of them is building the relationships, and that means doing a lot of drinking with the Chinese partners, and that's part of doing business. So, and it's whatever it takes. All right, so 2013, what does that look like for you? 2013's got a lot of... (laughs) <laughs> got a lot of exciting things going on. We actually have more opportunities than we even have executives to chase them right now around the world. Well, busy, fun times ahead. Thank you for taking some time to visit with us. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. And that wraps our discussion with Charles Dauber. We'll be back with more right after this. is the energy maker show brought to you by nrg moving clean energy forward and now back to the energy maker show i'm robin canoke welcome back to the energy maker show today i'm with bj stanberry the chief science officer the founder and the chairman of heliovolt welcome bj glad to have you here today thank you robin so tell us about heliovolt its technology and what makes you different in the market space well, Heliovolt is a uh, solar panel manufacturing company, okay. and we have a uh, different approach, very innovative approach, to manufacturing a second generation uh, technology for making uh, solar panels, and it's based on a, uh, a replacing 
the conventional uh, silicon wafer-based solar cells that you mm -hmm. see in, in solar panels across the world. Mm -hmm. Replacing with, it with? With thin coatings of semiconductors and metals and ceramics. We take thin coatings on a sheet of glass and we pattern those using lasers and then we use essentially integrated circuit type techniques mm -hmm. to make those circuits. So it's a really um, analogous to the transformation of the underlying technology in electronics and in consumer products from the old days of printed circuit boards mm -hmm. to the modern day of mm -hmm. integrated circuits mm -hmm. and from the old days of silicon based uh, solar cells to uh, this new generation of thin film photovoltaic integrated circuits or PVICs as I prefer to say. Okay well in this world of, of solar there's a couple of recent big marks right against the industry. Why can Heliovolt succeed when so many solar companies have recently failed, Solyndra being the one that really comes to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> several reasons. <clears throat> Number one, we, we, um, we haven't extended ourselves nearly as much as so overextended ourselves the way Solyndra did. Uh, we haven't uh, raised nearly as much money. I think they raised uh, $1.7 billion. And when you raise that much money that quickly, it creates a tremendous pressure for you to uh, get the cash flow going. And I think that they, um, they misunderstood, didn't uh, accurately judge the, <clears throat> the challenge, really, of bringing a, a very innovative new technology to the market. You know, if you look back at the history of technology development, it really takes decades to bring a truly new technology to the market. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the, the, uh, the, the semiconductor material that we share with Solyndra, Solyndra was also a thin film company. They used the same semiconductor material we do, CIGS, uh, but they really um, sort of bet the bank on a um, completely radical type of uh, module that had never been built, never been proven, and they misjudged how much it would cost to manufacture that. In the end, they, okay. they really couldn't make that uh, product that innovative cost effectively enough to uh, sell it without shipping dollars out the door. Was losing money every time they made a sale. That's a tough, you can't that, make up you, that, with yeah, that volume. That is a tough business model. Tell us about your background that made you prepared for this. I, I've been uh, committed to and engaged in the solar industry since uh, 1978 when I first finished my undergraduate degrees here at the University of Texas in Austin. Okay. And uh, at that point in time I made a commitment, a personal commitment of my career to what I now call my quest, which is to make solar electricity cheap and ubiquitous. And. Uh, I am uh, pleased that, that, I, uh, that I feel like uh, we're now on the threshold of actually achieving that goal. Uh, we have taken a new path with uh, a fundamental cost structure for the product that can do the same function, but, but basically has a lot less material cost than the cost of the, the silicon wafers that go into those conventional products. So that's how you plan on competing with... The Chinese is. manufacturers who seem to be dominating the industry right now. Right. Well, even they're losing money right now. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the one of the, the reasons why it's both a difficult environment, but it's a more difficult environment for those that are incumbents rather than up and company coming companies who have the opportunity to introduce a disruptive technology into the market with a much lower cost structure at the right time. So the energy mix of Texas, hmm. what's the right time there for solar? <laughs> Texas has one of the lowest costs of electricity in the entire world. United States and the world. In fact, mm -hmm. it's really only a few countries uh, that essentially subsidize their local electrical power, like Saudi, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. where the costs are significantly lower than Texas. Not because the fun fundamental economics justify that, but because it's heavily subsidized. Right. So... Uh, in, in the case of Texas, the only, the, the sort of the saving grace in terms of solar is that we've got so much sunshine here. And so uh, the sort of same set of equipment in Texas will generate a lot more uh, electricity 
than over, you know, averaged over a year or over the 25 year lifetime of the system, mm -hmm. than a, a similar system in the largest market in the world, which is Germany, uh, well, oddly I, enough. I and, find that fascinating. <laughs> well, again, there in the case of Germany, it's subsidies. subsidies. Now, personally, from a policy point of view, I've never been a big fan of subsidies. Uh, a lot of people promote them and look for them. I'm, I'm one of those uh, uh, businessmen that believes that you keep your eye on the basics. You figure out how to deliver a product that people want to buy because it's the smart buying decision for them to make. And until you're at that point, you need to keep working on, you know, stick drive to your knitting your and product. drive down your costs uh -huh. and, and make sure you come up with a, a solution for generating electricity that's more than just the modules, by the way. It really works for the customers. So when it comes to policy, my basic uh, uh, stand on that is we need to adopt, uh, we need to work to create more efficient markets for electricity mm -hmm. that uh, mo more closely allow consumers to pay the actual price, and then they'll make smarter decisions. Absolutely. BJ, thank you so much for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Robert. Absolutely. And that wraps up this episode of The Energy Makers, heard on the radio and seen online at theenergymakers.com. Yeah.